Hello and welcome to Firearm Freedom. This is going to be another full review video. In today's full review video, we are taking a look once again at the Cimarron 1911 a1. And quickly guys, before we get this video started, I wanted to let all of you know how you can support everything that I do here on the Firearm Freedom YouTube channel. You can head down to that description. In the description will be links to the Firearm Freedom merchandise store. On the merchandise store, you're going to find awesome things like hoodies, t-shirts, and stickers. And if merch is not for you, but you're still looking for a way to donate even as little as $1 a month, you can check out the Firearm Freedom Subscribe Star account. And of course, if you are not looking for any sort of a way to donate to the channel, then you can simply just watch these videos. Be sure to leave a comment down below. Let me know what you think of the videos. Let me know what I can do better next time. And absolutely hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. All of that stuff really, truly does help defeat the YouTube algorithms that are constantly pushing down gun content here on the platform. Wow, guys, <laughs> this this 1911 surprised me, I'm not gonna lie. I, I really did not think I would fall for it quite as hard as I did in this review process. You guys know that at this point, if I do a full review on the channel, that means that I hit that thousand round mark or more on that particular firearm, and we just hit that on this Cimarron 1911. This Cimarron went through a little bit of a different process for this full review video, mainly because this is probably the fastest full review video that I have ever done on the channel. I shot this for the first range day. You guys saw it just a few weeks ago here in a first impressions video. You can check out that first impressions video on a card up in the right hand corner of the screen right now. And after that first impressions video, I, I just wanted to shoot this thing more. I wanted to grab a holster for it, run it at the range in a little bit more of a practical setup. And then I also wanted to see just what this 1911 could take. So because I was planning on doing the full review as fast as I did, I actually did not clean it after that first range day. This thing has been really, really dirty and I have not really broken it apart other than to oil it in between each range day. It has been through a massively cold and blizzard-like range day, sitting on a picnic table, just getting snowed on for about three hours. And then on top of that, I also took it out on a very wet and cold, rainy range day where it just got absolutely soaking wet. And mind you, in between each of those range days, including the last range day, the only thing this has seen is the inside of my range bag. Took it out for a little bit of dry fire practice in the house, but this thing for the most part has been soaking wet and then drying, sitting in a damp range bag and then soaking wet again multiple times before this full review video has come out that you're watching now. And you will notice that probably the most impressive thing so far is the parkerizing job. There is absolutely no surface rust anywhere on this gun. Generally speaking, you can tell a really good parkerizing job from a bad parkerizing job with how well it holds up to the elements. And with all of those range days that it had, this thing was nasty. And I almost just assumed that the moment that I took it out of the range bag, there would be rust everywhere. And every single time I took it out, the finish looked pretty much exactly like how it looked out of the box. I've been throwing this thing around at the range not being kind to it, throwing it on the small dirt gravel on the ground, and still, I mean, there is barely any scrapes or scratches or anything on this finish. So I think that shows you once again that if you get a good, true kind of mill spec parkerizing job, it is going to hold up incredibly well to the elements. So not only did this thing not surface rust, but as it continued to get carboned up, even after this last range day, which I did somewhat of a pseudo torture test, I actually brought it to the range with 500 rounds of Tula steel case ammo. Now I'm one of those people that shoots a ton of steel case ammo. I've shot a ton of it through my 1911s and they've never had a problem. But with that being said, Tula definitely runs dirtier than a lot of other brass ammunition. And the big complaint with a lot of 1911s is, hey, I am an instructor. I run pistol classes and I've seen a lot of 1911s fail in these pistol 
pistol classes with even as low as 500 rounds. So the goal was to showcase that this particular 1911, even after two previous nasty weather condition range days and not being cleaned, still lasted through that 500 rounds of nasty, dirty, Tula steel case ammo, ran 500 rounds through it in the span of about 45 minutes, and this thing really chugged along great. On top of that, at the range day, I was also running my brand new T-Rex Arms Ragnarok set up for the 1911. The Ragnarok holster actually worked really well. The one thing that I will note about it is that the screws are actually almost completely loosened. They're almost falling out of the holster, and this still has a good amount of retention. And I should also note that it doesn't have any sort of a click in retention. It's just more of a friction fit. So once it gets on there, you just know that it's properly seated in once it stops moving. I'm definitely one of those people that really enjoy having somewhat of a click into place retention. So that way you can kind of audibly hear that the gun is properly in the holster. For a range holster, this Ragnarok worked just fine. And I was able to run it on my standard Orion battle belt setup on a Safari Land QLS fork system with their mid-ride belt loop setup. And really, this 1911 worked great. The one thing that I will note in regards to drawing the 1911 out of the holster is that if you are not used to drawing a 1911 out of a holster like that, you do have to remember that you have this mil-spec A1 style beaver tail and that beaver tail is definitely sticking straight up. It's a little bit pointy. So if you don't have gloves on and you come straight down, it's really easy to nail that beaver tail with a good amount of force trying to draw the pistol out quickly. So you have to remember to kind of come right about like almost like you're swooping into the pistol and grab it underneath the beaver tail. Once you practice that a few times at the house, you shouldn't have any issues. And of course, you can also run gloves at the range just in case you nail that beaver tail so it doesn't grab your hand and rip it open because that would definitely not feel too good. And quickly, just to showcase how dirty this thing is, this is the first time I've broken it open after that 500 rounds of tool ammo at the range. And I wanted to throw on just these blue gloves because I knew it would be pretty nasty and uh, you can tell that this thing is really, really caked up. It definitely needs a bit of a bath, and you can see all of the uh, carbon there starting to pile up uh, real good on all the rails that the slide is, is moving on. You can see a lot of the carbon just kind of piling up right there, real gunked up. And again, this thing still ran great. Now, to be fair, I did oil it in the tracks there, so that way it would at least have a little bit of a chance, simply because all of that rain and snow just wiped all the oil clean off of the gun. But I should mention that between that snowy range day and the rainy range day, I actually did not oil it. So on the really rainy, cold range day, that was run with pretty much no oil after that really bad snowy range day. I would imagine that when I clean up all this carbon from the gun, it is going to show a little bit more of a wear pattern, but I am still incredibly impressed with the gun and how it performed being this nasty. And I think with how carboned up this 1911 is right now, it shows you that 1911s, in my opinion and my experience, have been incredibly reliable provided you get a looser tolerance 1911. You'll hear that typical shake side to side. And it's funny because a lot of people with 1911s will be in a gun shop and they're really trying to feel just how tight that really high dollar 1911 can get and how precisely machined the tolerances are. And what people don't realize is these guns were never designed to be like that. They were designed to have a little bit of that wobble. So generally, if you're shaking the 1911 and you hear a little bit of wobble, that is going to mean that your gun is probably going to be far less finicky and far more reliable than even some of the really high dollar, really expensive 1911s. Now, granted, this may not be as bench rest competition accurate as those 1911s, but I would definitely take something like this that is incredibly affordable. If you guys remember from the first impressions video, I picked this thing up used for 400 bucks. I would much rather have this option and have it be super reliable than have something that can get clover leaves at 50 yards out of a pistol. In my opinion, with those looser tolerances, it's going to be able to work through a lot of that carbon buildup and grit 
just like any other semi-automatic pistol out there, and it is not gonna have anywhere near as many fail points. So ironically, a lot of the time, the more you spend on a 1911, the more finicky and the more unreliable it is going to be. Now, obviously, after you go through the break-in period on a lot of those high dollar 1911s, they're gonna get a little bit more reliable, but still, a lot of folks say that as soon as they get past that 500 round mark and the gun even gets a little bit carboned up, all of a sudden they're having issues left and right and it needs to be cleaned, and then of course it runs reliably again. With this Cimarron 1911A1, you're not gonna have that problem. And of course, although Cimarron is the importer of this 1911, at its base, again, as you can see here underneath the frame, it is made in the Philippines at the Rock Island Armory plant. It is essentially a Rock Island pistol that Cimarron imports. A lot of folks made some comments in the last video about the roll marking. In particular, this roll marking was kind of the make it or break it thing from your typical Rock Island 1911 from the Cimarron 1911A1 that you see here, and I would agree. I really was never down for the Rock Island marking on the slide or any sort of bold Rock Island markings anywhere on it. I just didn't really like the look of it. Obviously, the 1911 is still generally going to perform just as good. I think Cimarron knocked it out of the park with this A1 clone and their own roll marking on the side, very similar to a Colt roll marking. This thing checks off all the boxes for me for your traditional collector's 1911A1 and even something, if you really wanted to, to use as a defensive gun. I wouldn't have any issues putting this thing in a defensive roll. Again, my gripe with this 1911 in a defensive roll is just with the size and weight that it has, it still is lacking in the capacity department. Now, for the majority of the filming in this full review video, I was using these Wilson Combat 10 round magazines. I think if you were looking for a little bit more than normal capacity on your 1911, these 10 round mags are probably the best way to go. Obviously with 10 plus one, you're gonna get 11 rounds, which for a 45 is not too terribly bad. You'll see a lot of other options that beat it out like the USP and the Glock 21 that are gonna be 13 rounds plus one. But for a 1911, I think 11 rounds isn't too bad compared to seven or eight, which is what it generally comes with. Along with these Wilson Combat 10 round mags, I also still ran the Metgar mag. This is an eight round Metgar mag and this ran just fine, no problems at all. I ran an eight round Wilson Combat mag. Again, absolutely no issues. And then finally, I ran the factory seven round GI mag that came with it. And again, no issues here either. This ran 100%. You guys will remember me noting that we had one bad Springfield stainless magazine in the first impressions video that led to just some minor issues. I did not use that mag again after those issues, and of course, they all went away. I did have one failure to feed that was a little bit random in this testing, and that was the first round in a Wilson Combat 10 round magazine. It was on a cold and rainy range day when I was not performing as good as I should have because I was just kind of miserable. And I do believe since it was the first round in the magazine that I actually rode the slide home a little bit. With these 1911s, you really gotta be a little bit aggressive when you rack that slide back. You don't wanna walk it home at all because generally speaking, the 45 is gonna be a little bit flatter on the nose of the bullet and it can really easily smack that feed ramp and not go into the barrel if you walk the slide home. So I am accounting that one malfunction out of the thousand rounds that I had through it, my fault rather than the guns. Other than that, it ran 100% reliably. As far as accuracy, I was walking out to even 50 yards on a small steel silhouette target. It was definitely more than capable of hitting that steel silhouette target, and I did land multiple hits, but I also had a lot of misses. And the reason why I was getting these misses was not the fault of the gun not being accurate, but mainly my fault of not reading the sights. It is still incredibly difficult with these small government sights that are all blacked out and tough to see to pick them up for a far pistol shot, which would be a 50 round shot on those steel targets. It is not an easy shot to accomplish with these sights. But close up on steel or close up on paper, this thing rips it up at the range. Fast follow-up shots are no problem at all. You will notice a little bit of a different recoil just with the added recoil of the 45 in general. 
And then also the way that the gun just presents itself, it has a little bit of a wobble back and forth with the recoil. But once you learn that, you can actually really ride the recoil properly and make sure you are getting fast follow-up shot. But once you learn to shoot it and shoot it properly, this thing can run real fast without any issues at all. That is pretty much going to wrap up this full review video on this Cimarron 1911 A1. Brand spanking new, these things are still generally under $500, even in all this craziness. And I have to say, if you can find one, I would not hesitate. I would pick one of these things up if you're looking for a standard 1911 A1 to add into the collection. If you have any other comments about this pistol in particular, or anything else on the channel, throw them down below in the comment section and you guys know I absolutely will get back to you. While you're down there, head up to the description and check out the links to the Firearm Freedom Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram account. I have daily posts over on all three of those accounts that you guys are not going to want to miss. As always, thank you so much for watching and stay tuned for more great videos to come soon.